Thanks, Eric, and I hope you got to know him just a little bit better this morning. We're delighted and just thrilled to have uh, him on our staff helping us lead worship, uh, particularly at this campus, but at all our campuses. So thanks, Eric. So does anyone here this morning actually remember the old game show, Let's Make a Deal? Anybody? Oh, good. I was a little afraid I'd reach too far back into the past uh, for that one. Let's Make a Deal was first aired in what year? Anybody know? 1963. Bonus question, who was the original host? Who's this guy? Monty Hall, correct, very good. Now, Let's Make a Deal was actually one of the most popular TV game shows of the entire decade of the 60s and also of the 70s. So popular that they actually reprised it in the 2000s. I didn't even know that because I didn't watch it, but I used to watch it back when I was a kid. Let's Make a Deal. And here's how the show worked. Uh, People would come to the studio audience dressed in all sorts of funny outfits, hoping to get noticed by Monty Hall, because if he noticed you, he might invite you to be a contestant on the show, and then he might offer to buy your goofy hat for a $100 bill. And then later in the show, he would give you the chance to trade that $100 bill for whatever was behind, for example, door number one, or whatever was in the giant box, only you wouldn't know what was gonna be in the box or behind the door. But you'd have to trade 100 bucks if you wanted to try. It might be a $5,000 vacation to Tahiti, or it might be a hard-boiled egg. You didn't know, remember the show? So I thought we'd play our own little version of Let's Make a Deal today. You don't seem very excited. (laughs) I need two volunteers. I need two fun, smart, above average people (laughs) to be a part of my game show. So just raise your hand and I'll, and I'll show, you gotta show some excitement. You gotta make me wanna choose you. Okay, raise your hand if you're willing to be in, in my game show. Okay, right there, come on up and one more. You wanna be in the game show? Come on up, all right, here we go. And stand on this side over here. Little applause. Okay. We need audience participation, so right up here. Come stand right by the table. So as the audience, this is, by the way, the original game show music. Very nice. So whenever you see your instructions on the screen as the audience, you have to do what what it says, right? Got it? All right. So we have to first introduce you to our studio audience here. So you're contestant number one. What's your name? Emma. Emma. Big applause for Emma. Thank you. Contestant number one. And contestant number two? Anna Rose. Anna Rose. Anna Rose, thank you. Okay. Now, just for being brave enough to be on the show today, you get a gift to start off with, okay? These are two $5 gift cards to Starbucks. I don't know if you like Starbucks or not. They have like milkshakes and stuff there. So there and there. So now, now you have the chance to participate in the show by trading. If you want, you can keep the card or you can trade it for any one of these five envelopes to see what's in there. But to get, do that, you have to give me back the card. Okay, so now, Emma, contestant number one, do you want to keep the card or do you want to trade it in? Trade. You want to keep it or do you want to trade it? Keep or trade it? Okay. She's under a lot of pressure. What do you want to do? It's hard, I know. Um, there could be something really cool. You don't know. You want to trade? Or you want to keep? Um, you want to think about it for a second? Yeah. Okay. Emma Rose, what would you like to do? Uh, no, Anna Rose. Anna Rose, right? Anna Rose. Do you want to keep or trade? trade. She's going to trade. Okay, so <laughs> give me the... Yeah. So any one of the five. Okay. Let's open it up and see what you win. Oh, she got a wildebeest. (laughs) Now, fortunately for you, all you won was a picture of a wildebeest, not the actual wildebeest, okay? So here, thank you for playing. I'm actually going to give you your... Hang on a second. Let's see what... Let's see what you decided. You want to trade? They want you to trade. Let's trade. Okay. (laughs) Which, which one do you want to pick? Number one. Okay, open up number one. See what you got. Whoa, look what you got. Open it up. You got another card. This one is $10. All right, you got a $10 gift card to Starbucks. Big applause for our contestant. And by the way, you get to take, take this with you anyway. So thank you very much. 
just so you know, none of them got the real prize. This one was a brand new Lexus. A picture of a brand new Lexus. And there was also, I almost forget what's in these. They were really good though. A uh, World Series ticket. Picture of a World Series ticket. And the last one was, don't tell anybody in the next service, by the way. A vacation to Hawaii. A picture of a vacation to Hawaii. Now, I did all that just to be able to ask this question. What is a better deal? To get a picture of the gift or the prize or to get the actual prize itself? Which is a better deal? Picture or the real thing? We're in a series now, as all of you know, called Jesus is Greater Than. And just to give you a little review, we've done this week by week, but it's really important to remember and know why this letter was originally written 2,000 years ago. It was written in the latter half of the first century to some Jewish background followers of Jesus, Christians, Jewish background Christians, who were entering into a time of severe suffering and persecution, one of the first major persecutions that ever happened to Christians, uh, and it happened during the time of the Roman Empire. And so some of them have begun to say to themselves, you know, this following Jesus thing hasn't worked out so good for us. Maybe we should go back to just the Jewish way of thinking. Maybe we should go back to what we used to think before, back to the system of law and sacrifices and priests and so forth. So the author is writing them to encourage them not to give up, to hang on to their faith because Jesus is greater than. Greater than the prophets, greater than the angels. He's the eternal word of God, and as such, he's the very agent of creation itself, therefore greater even than the universe. And then we went through how the author says, even though Jesus is greater than, he became lesser than, taking the form of human flesh so that he could offer the final sacrifice for our sins. And then in chapter 4, we came to this beautiful verse that says, Since we have such a great high priest, then let us come with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace. A beautiful thought. It means no matter how far you've been from God, no matter how long you've run from God, Eric talked about his own struggle of faith earlier in his life, that you can still come with confidence to God through the grace of Christ because of what he's done. Then last week we looked at the passage that says we have this hope as an anchor for our souls. How the promise of Christ becomes our sure hope. We'll talk about it a little bit later today. Now today we're going to dig in a little bit deeper and actually look at what I think is one of the most difficult chapters in the entire New Testament. Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, we're going to read uh, parts of it, not the whole thing. But if you're in a book club and you're reading through Hebrews and you've gotten to this chapter, you kind of know what I'm talking about. But it's important for us to understand. So we're going to read a little bit. I'm going to explain a little bit. And then we'll get into the heart of today's text. So Hebrews chapter 7, beginning of verse 1. The author says, For this Melchizedek... How many of you ever heard of Melchizedek before? Oh, good. How many know who Mel Melchizedek is? Uh, not, so, not so sure. Okay, we'll talk about Melchizedek in just a second. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, we know who Abraham was, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Okay, who is Melchizedek? Who is this guy? And why is he so important that these verses are dedicated to him? Well, if we go back line by line, here's a few things that we are already, we've already seen right here in this chapter. First it says, Melchizedek was king of Salem. Now, Salem we don't know what that is until we realize it was an a the ancient region that eventually became called Jerusalem. So it's the very center of the entire Judeo-Christian tradition. This is where this guy started. So we pay attention to that. Then it says Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. Now, the original readers of this letter would have immediately gone, whoa, that's interesting. To us, it doesn't really mean much. But to them, it did, because they knew that the Levitical priesthood had not even begun yet, hadn't even been invented yet, and Moses hadn't even been born yet. The law hadn't even been given to Moses yet, yet this Melchizedek predated all of that stuff. They would have gone, hmm, that's interesting. 
Then it says, he met Abraham as he returned from the slaughter of kings and blessed him. Now what's that about? Well, way back in Genesis 14, we read this weird, strange story about Abraham, or evidently Abram was involved in a series of skirmishes, like battles with local pagan kings, little city-states around the region where he lived. And at one point, they had captured one of his relatives. He had this battle with 318, it's very specific, 318 warriors from his family tribe, and they went and got back and rescued this relative, so they won this little battle. And then this guy, Melchizedek, shows up, priest of the Most High God, and blesses Abraham with bread and wine, Genesis 14 says. Let's see, bread and wine, bread and wine. What's that remind you of? Right. Then it says, Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. In other words, Abraham gave Melchizedek then a tithe offering, which told the people reading this, oh, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham because only the lesser gives a tithe to the greater to thank him for his blessing. And then it says, his name means, listen, king of righteousness and king of peace. He has no recorded genealogy, doesn't have beginning or an end that we know of. That's just simply saying we think he came from God. He resembles the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. Now, putting all that together, who does that remind you of? Anybody? Jesus, right? Jesus. Now, we have two options here to consider who Melchizedek was. One is to say... He was the, a pre-incarnate form of Christ who appeared in a mysterious way. Or we can say, as most scholars do, that Melchizedek is what's called a type of Christ. That is, Melchizedek was a kind of picture of what, would, what was to come, the person and work of Jesus. So Melchizedek only appears three times in all the Bible. Once in Genesis 14 where he first appears to bless Abraham with wine and bread. Then in Psalm 110, right in the middle of your Bible, about a thousand years later, he's written into a messianic psalm. That is a psalm looking forward to the coming of God's Messiah that had not happened yet. When, when the Psalm 110 says uh, he will be a priest forever of the order of Melchizedek. And then here in Hebrews, a thousand years after that, when Melchizedek shows up in this letter. So why is he here? Why do we need to know this? Well, first of all, remember, the original readers of this letter were Jewish background Christians. They knew the story of Abraham. They knew who Melchizedek was. So the author's making a point to the original readers that Melchizedek, mysterious as he is, is greater than Abraham, and therefore greater than the priesthood that came through Abraham. So the role Melchizedek plays in Hebrews is to point toward Jesus. He replaces the entire system of the law and the priests and the sacrifices. Jump ahead to verse 11, we see this. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? Now, okay, again, this is kind of fuzzy to us. Like, what's he talking about? Well, he's simply saying that the entire system, the entire Jewish system of law, Ten Commandments, priests, and sacrifices was never intended by God to be final. That from the very beginning, Melchizedek was pointing ahead to a greater priesthood and a greater sacrifice. Verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, that is a human priesthood, but by the power of an indestructible life. There's our greatest clue. Who's he talking about? Whose life proved to be indestructible? Jesus, right? He's talking about the resurrection. For it is witnessed of him, quote, and whenever you see quotes in the Bible, it's important because it's quoting itself. Quote, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's a direct quote from Psalm 110, a psalm looking ahead to the Messiah. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and, un and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Okay, that's where we're going to begin today, the message. First, we see Jesus is a better hope, a better hope. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I traveled uh, to Ohio to share in a marriage, uh, sort of a couple's event night at um, 
Christ Community Chapel in Hudson, Ohio, where my brother is the lead pastor. We shared it with he and his wife, Karen. It's a really fun night, great turnout. And we're looking forward to our own Chapel Street Couples event coming in January. Lorene and I are going to present alongside Pastor Jeff and his wife, Erin, which is the first time we will have done that as a group of four. So it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. You'll see um, information coming out about that in the next month or so. But my brother lives in Hudson, which is halfway between Akron and Cleveland, and he's lived there now for 25 years, which means my brother is not only a pastor, not only a husband, father of three grown children and four beautiful grandchildren, but my brother is also a diehard Cleveland sports fan. It's just so sad. (laughs) Of course, the Indians haven't won the World Series since 1948, and they lost again in heartbreaking fashion this past week to the Yankees in Game 5. And last year, of course, they lost, his Indians lost to my Cubs in Game 7 of the World Series, which produced this picture. I love this picture for lots of reasons. (laughs) Now, my brother is fiercely competitive. I'm competitive, but my brother, he's my younger brother, he's fiercely competitive. So even though he suffered so much frustration being a Cleveland fan throughout the years, even though he tries hard, he tries his best not to hope for victory. He actually tries not to hope, but he can't help it. He still hopes, and then his little heart is crushed. Now, how many Cubs fans do we have here today? Any Cubs fans? Anybody feeling a little bit sad today? A little bit anxious today? Right? Lost game one last night. But what? Do we still have hope? Oh, we still have hope, right? It's human to hope. Every human being hopes. But what is hope? That's the question that was at the center of last week's sermon. What is hope? Most people, most of the time, think of hope as kind of wishful thinking. I hope something good happens in my future. I hope my team wins. I hope things go well. But the hope Hebrews is talking about right at the center of the letter is a different kind of hope. Not hope as optimism, hope as certainty. A hope that is anchored in Jesus, who by his incarnation, becoming lesser, his death and resurrection, his indestructible life, he gives us a new heart through the forgiveness of sin. We sang about that earlier. We're going to talk about it a little bit later in the message. New identity by adopting us into God's family, which means that if you're in Christ today, You are no longer defined by your past, by your family, by your education, by your business success, by your failures, by your gender. You're not identified by any of those things. You have new identity. You've been adopted into his family. You're defined by the love of Christ for you. He also gives us new new purpose. We are now to serve in his kingdom and a new destiny, which is eternal life in the new heaven and new earth in the presence of God himself. That's the gospel. Therefore, Jesus is our sure hope, the anchor for our souls. Verse 20. And it was not without an oath, that's talking about the promise of God, for those who formerly became priests and were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, quote, pay attention again, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. That's again a direct quote from Psalm 110, right in the middle of the Bible. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. So, Jesus is a better hope, not hope as wishful thinking, not hope in hope itself. We see that a lot in our culture today. Just have hope. Hope in what? Hope in who? Hope in hope. Not any of that kind of hope, but a certain hope. Because Jesus guarantees a better covenant. Now, if we're reading this from our perspective, modern, you know, 21st century um, uh, Gentile followers of Christ, most of us here are not Jewish background, we read this and go, well, sure, of course, Jesus is better. That's why we're here, right? That's why we follow Jesus. We believe in Jesus. Of course he's better. It doesn't strike us as odd. But if we try to understand this from the perspective of a Jewish person living 2,000 years ago, here's what we think. Abraham was chosen and called by God. God promised Abraham that he would become the father of a great nation before he had any children at all, and that the whole earth would be blessed through him. Now, what could be better than that? What could be better than God's covenant with Abraham? What could possibly be better than a picture of a vacation to Hawaii? 
So now by starting with Melchizedek, the author is building a detailed and careful historical and theological argument to demonstrate to these Jewish background Christians that God's covenant with Abraham was never intended to be the end of the story. That's why they shouldn't go back. That's why they shouldn't let go of their faith. The old covenant with the law, meaning Ten Commandments, sacrifices, and priests was never meant to be a permanent solution because it was incomplete, always pointing towards something else, which is why he says in verse 11, which we already read, now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? Jesus would not have been necessary. Now he's reminding them that the law, the Ten Commandments, does not save. Rather, the law demonstrates our need for forgiveness, demonstrates the need for a sacrifice to cover our sin because we're all law breakers. The law demonstrates our need for a high priest, one who is both qualified and able to present us to God. All of this points toward Jesus. That's the point of the letter of the Hebrews. Now, we aren't first century Jewish background people, but I think, I think we all understand what I would call law-based religion. For example, if you were to go home later today and if it's not raining, you're walking around your neighborhood, and if you were to just ask a random neighbor or at work tomorrow, you ask a random coworker, hey, I got a question for you. It would be a little weird to do this, but if you did it, you would say, I got a question for you. What do you think God wants most from you? What do you think qualifies you someday to be in God's heaven if there is a heaven? Most people in our culture, if you ask them that, would say, well, God wants to me, me to be a good person. He wants me to be the best person I can be. That's law-based religion. And that's the default mode of almost every human being. We want to do good, be the best we can be, and hope that's good enough. Now, here's the problem. Good enough compared to what? Good enough compared to who? Good enough compared to Charles Manson? I'm doing pretty good. Good enough compared to Stephen Paddock? Or good enough compared to Mother Teresa? Hmm. Good enough compared to Billy Graham? Good enough compared to Jesus himself? Where's the standard? Here's the problem with law-based religion. Religion might tell you how to be good, but it cannot save you. The law might tell you how to be good, but it does not save. Because how do we know when we've been good enough. Which leads us to the second point today. Jesus is a better salvation. A better salvation. My freshman year in college, I lived right down the hall from a, a classmate named Charlie. He was a freshman the same time I was a freshman. Charlie. And Charlie was, um, in the slang of the day, a party animal. That is, he liked to have a good time. Most of the guys on my floor liked to have a good time, but partly Charlie really knew how to have a good time. I mean, he uh, drank to excess quite a bit, quite often. He uh, used uh, vulgar language like he invented it. Uh, there was some, there were often, late at night, there was funny smelling smoke wafting underneath his door. Uh, his girlfriend visited often and stayed with him. So Charlie was all the things that I'd kind of been taught my whole life not to be. That was Charlie. He was a good guy, a fun guy, but he was Charlie. Probably at that point in my life, the person furthest from God that I'd ever met. That's just how I saw Charlie. Now, at the time, I was a kind of um, closet Christian. I was a follower of Jesus, but I wasn't really anxious to be known freshman year as, you know, that guy, that, the Bible thumper guy on, on, on the floor. I just wasn't, so I was a little quiet about my faith. Uh, so I never had a single conversation with Charlie that I remember about spiritual things. In fact, if you had asked me, I would have said, well, I'm not even sure God can save Charlie, you know. So fast forward about 20 years. One day I'm sitting at home and I get a quarterly journal from my alma mater. And I sometimes don't read it at all. Sometimes I flip through it and look for class notes. So this time I was flipping through it and in the kitchen, flipping through to my class, 1978, to see what guys are doing, see if anybody in there I recognize. And there was a little note, little note, and I recognized Charlie's name. Here's what the note said. It said, Charlie had his last name, and his wife have been appointed as Wycliffe Bible translators in West Africa. <laughs> I almost fell off my chair. 
I started hollering for my wife, Lori, come here, come here, look at this Charlie. She didn't know Charlie. She didn't go to the same school I went to. This is Charlie. Look at Charlie. He's a missionary. So then I spent the next couple of years trying to contact Wycliffe to contact Charlie, but they wouldn't give me his email because he worked, he worked at that time translating scriptures in a very sensitive, dangerous part of West Africa. So they couldn't give away his identity or his location, so I couldn't contact him. Fast forward another 15 years or so. Out of the blue, I get an email from Charlie. He's emailing me because he found my profile on Facebook, found out I was a pastor in Geneva, and he said his daughter was a student at Wheaton College. And he wondered if she ever needed a place to go because he was still living in Africa. Could she come and just hang out at our house? I said, Charlie, email. I'm, we're all do, doing this through email. Charlie, of course. Tell me, tell me your story. How did you, and so he told me a little bit of his story. He had said, tell me your story. I told him a little of my story. And then the last thing he said to me on email was, who would have ever thought God could use a couple of slugs like us, he said. <laughs> it was so good. Us, he said. And it dawned on me, that while I wasn't like Charlie in college, he didn't know any different because there's no way he could have known I was a follower of Jesus. Slugs like us. Verse 23. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Let's, let's pause there. It says, Jesus is a better salvation because he saves to the uttermost. What an interesting word. The Greek word translated uttermost here means completely, entirely, and finally. So what does it mean to save to the uttermost? Well, it means, first of all, Jesus is able to save anyone, that he can save from any depth of depravity, any depth of darkness or sin or distance. There's no distance that the grace of Christ cannot reach, not in Charlie, not in Eric, not in me, not in you. It means he saves completely. That is, there's nothing left to be forgiven. No word, no action, no matter how selfish, however shameful, is left stuck to our souls. The grace of Christ cleans it all. Now, I was thinking about that this week when I was making popcorn. We started a couple years ago going back to making popcorn the old-fashioned way with oil and, you know, and really popping it. It's just so good, better than the microwave stuff. So we were making, I was making popcorn. But I, I kind of, I want to get all of it popped, you know, so I, I keep leaving, I'm shaking it, shaking it, shaking it, I wait until it stops popping. But I really want to get all of it popped. And I waited a little too long. So, the, so I poured out the popcorn. The very bottom of the pan, the last kernels are just burnt to a crisp. They're black and burnt. And you know, they're stuck to the bottom of that pan. So I got to clean out this pan because my wife's going to say, why'd you cook it so long? Why'd you ruin the pan? So I'm scrubbing out the pan. And no matter how hard I scrubbed, I couldn't get the black spots off the bottom of the pan. I couldn't clean it to the uttermost. See, sometimes I think, even as believers, even as followers of Christ, we kind of think like this. Well, I know Jesus forgives me, but he, I, know he, he, I think he kind of forgives me mostly. He forgives most of that stuff, but that, but that stuff, there's still that stuff that some stuff just sticks. He can't reach that, whatever that is for you. No, he says. He saves to the uttermost. He saves completely, and he saves forever, finally. Why? Because, it says, Jesus lives to make intercession. Now, what does that mean? Now, intercession is a fancy word for prayer. It means to intercede for someone else. Like when you pray for a friend, you're stepping in front of that friend, interceding for them on behalf of them to God, interceding. What does it mean that Jesus intercedes for you? How do you wrap your head around that? Here's what I think. If you're a parent today, you don't, you don't have to be a parent to understand this, but if you're a parent, I think you know what this is. I've often said, I don't think I even began to understand the love of God until I became a parent. Because when you're a parent, you love your children, your child, with your very life. And it's because you love them like that that you don't control them. You don't chain them in their rooms to keep something bad from happening to them. You can't. That's not love. So you let them go. 
and they seek their independence, and they make their own decisions. But you never stop loving them, thinking of them, praying for them. You never stop. Daily, hourly, weekly, you never stop. It doesn't matter how old they get, how independent they get, how far away they go, you never stop. That's the way Jesus intercedes for you. Before the Father, this one, this one is mine. I've saved him or her to the uttermost. There's nothing left to be forgiven. And he intercedes constantly. He lives to make intercession for you. And in this way, Jesus is thirdly a better high priest. Verse 26, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unsustained, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Pretty good description. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. Since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now, to the ancient Jew, the role of the high priest was absolutely critical because they knew that God, Jehovah, Yahweh, was holy. They got the holiness of God. In fact, he was so holy that there was a veil that stood between them and the Holy of Holies because they could enter into the presence of a holy God because they were sinful. The holiness of God would have burnt them like a popcorn crisp, right? They understood holiness. But the high priest alone could go back there and make sacrifices on their behalf, could intercede for them. And even when the high priest went in there, they had to tie a cord around his waist in case he was sinful and he dropped dead, they could drag him out of the Holy of Holies. They understood holiness. They needed a priest to go before them, a mediator to do what they could not do for themselves. The high priest was kind of a bridge to God. Hebrews is telling us that Jesus became the better high priest, and we'll see this theme throughout the book, the rest of the book. He became a better high priest first because he's the son, not a human priest, but the very son of God. Secondly, because he's been made perfect forever, holy, innocent, unstained, has no need to make sacrifices for himself because he has no sin. Thirdly, because he offered up one sacrifice forever, one and done. No more sacrifice ever needed because he offered up himself as that sacrifice. Years ago while I was in seminary, I had a class um, where we were, the professor um, wanted us to participate in a, a street ministry in Chicago. And the task was, we were to, he was going to take us down to the city, drop us off, and we had to some way, somehow, initiate a spiritual conversation with a total stranger just on the street, way out of my comfort zone. But I couldn't avoid it, so I did it. Maybe it'll be good for me. I made myself, so I, I, I got on the bus, we went down to the city, dropped us off, and I'm walking along the street thinking, how in the world am I going to have a spiritual conversation with a stranger? So I'm walking along the street thinking, what am I going to do? And I don't know how long I walked, but I finally, was, finally saw a man standing up, leaning up against the wall, uh, wall of a building, kind of tattered, dirty suit on. He was older than me, maybe twice as old as me maybe in his 60s, and he was literally holding a ha- his hat out, and people were dropping change into his hat. I, I re- realized it's a homeless man. So I lo- watched for a while, walked by him once, trying to get up the courage, walked by again, and then I noticed there was a McDonald's right across the street, and I got a, a, an idea. So I walked up to him and said, hey, um, I'm thinking about, I'm going over there to get a, a burger at McDonald's. You, you, you want to join me? Get a burger? And he looked at me kind of surprised, and he went, Sure, burger sounds good. So he walked with me across the street to this McDonald's. So we sat down, ordered cheeseburgers and a Coke, I think, and we're just talking for like 30 minutes. We just sat and talked. I found out his name was John. Found out he was indeed homeless, but had not always been. Grew up in a family, had his own family, a family he had not seen for many years now because of his long, slow slide into all kinds of problems and issues. Then he asked about me. He was interested. He said, who are you? What are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm a seminary student. Actually, I had a class where I'm supposed to have a spiritual conversation with somebody. That's why I'm here. And then he said to me, I haven't been in church in a long, long time. He grew up in the church, but he said, I haven't been in a long time. And then, so fast forward, we finished up our burgers, and then he said to me, he said, hey, I got to be honest with you, man. I said, what's that? He goes, "Um," this is his words, not mine. He said, I'm a wino. 
and I could really use $5 for a drink, he said. I said, thanks for your honesty. Um, but John, I think I'm here just to tell you and remind you that, that God loves you, knows you. No matter how long you've been away, you can always come back. And then I took out $5 and I gave it to him. And I said, I hope you'll use this to buy food, not wine. And then he said, I hope so too. We got up, we went to leave the restaurant, walked out, turned around, shook hands with him. We went to turn, went to turn a walk our separate ways and he said, hey. I turned around, he went, he said to me, you're gonna make a heck of a priest someday, he said. Only well, he didn't say heck of a, he said another word. <laughs> I never saw John again, obviously, but I've never forgotten that little conversation and what he said and how it went. And to this day, I wish I'd taken another 30 minutes and tried to explain to him that you don't need a priest, a human priest like me. You don't need that. Because there is a great high priest who promises that no matter how far you've been away, no matter how long it's been, no matter how deep the issues are, no matter how much the bottle has destroyed your life and your family, there is a high priest who saves to the uttermost. To the uttermost. See, I think every human being has some kind of priest. That is, every human being has something they hope will make them good with God, whoever God is. Might be, just gotta be a good person. Be the best me I can be. Might be their religion. Might be going to church. Might be following religious rituals. But the letter to the Hebrews says there's only one high priest with the position and the authority to save to the uttermost. And that's Jesus, because he is greater than. Let me bow in prayer as we close. Lord, thank you for your word today. For this ancient letter written to a group of people so much different from us, but in other ways so similar. People who were fearful, losing hope, questioning their faith. Remind us again that you are greater, greater than our fears, greater than our failures, greater than our sin, greater than religion itself. Remind us that you and only you save to the uttermost. In your name we pray, amen. If for whatever reason you felt far from God in recent days and today feel compelled to draw near and have a spiritual conversation about the one who saves to the uttermost, we have prayer partners, I'll be down here, we'll have a conversation and have prayer with you, we'd love to do that. So just come up after the benediction if you'd like to. Benediction today comes from Jude, the letter in the New Testament, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority, both now and forever. Amen. Have a great day.